aspect of the presentation. Uh, so for this evening, I'd like to formally welcome Brian Kenny to our Thursday Food for Thought. And uh, our lecture this evening will be recorded for potential use on our uh, Old Pueblo Archaeology YouTube channel. So other people can enjoy what's going on. Uh, Brian Kenny worked most recently at Colorado State University providing cultural, environmental, and climate change analysis for programs, programs at the Pentagon. His prior work included permanent positions in federal agencies for 20 years and Arizona State agencies for 25 years. His er earliest work in archaeology was in cultural resource management, aka contract archaeology. Brian served in the US Air Force and holds degrees from the American Graduate School of International Management, also known as Thunderbird, and from Arizona State University, which we'll forgive him for because we're in Tucson. Among his life adventures and accomplishments, Brian rode on trains and boxcars, hitchhiked across the United States on multiple occasions, and hiked the Grand Canyon from rim to rim. He wore a wire undercover for a year in an FBI criminal investigation that resulted in successful prosecution. He worked as a forensic anthropologist repatriating service members missing in Laos and exhumed surreptitiously buried murder victims located by police in the US. He's married his long suffering wife and they've been married for 45 years and counting. Together they enjoy family gatherings, gardening, foraging for wild edible plants and herbs, cooking, wilderness hiking, long road trips around the nation, and international travel. They remain steadfast dog people, but are friendly with cats. Although he has tried other things along the way, Brian says at his core, he is an applied anthropologist and archeologist. This evening, he will present an opportunity to explore a much um, additional research regarding Dr. George McJunkin, a black cowboy who discovered the type site of North America's Folsom Paleo Indian culture. Please welcome this month's third Thursday Food for Thought guest speaker, Dr. Mr. Brian Kelly. Thank you. Let's see, I'm supposed to share my screen? Yes, please. Try that. Am I good to go there? Yeah, just do the slideshow and from beginning. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, slideshow. The tab okay. at the top. There you go. That's good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, AJ. Uh, I'm Brian Kenny. I'm not going to um, read for most of this, but I have a couple notes I need to read to get started here and then we'll go through the slides. I'll try to be very quick. Um, so the problem I have is one of applied anthropology. Applied anthropology is a type of anthropology that tries to solve a business problem or a cultural problem. And uh, that's what I've been working on for uh, the past couple of years with George McJunkin. Um, I think that the end game for this project will be a field school for Black, Indigenous, people of color, and others who want to um, learn earth sciences and archaeology in a historical setting. But we don't know that we're going to get there or not. We started the project to learn more about George McJunkin and update uh, how we think about him, because George's uh, most of the information about George is, is starting to age out a bit. It's about 50 years old. There's been some more recent things, but a lot of the things that you'll read when you go to Google Scholar or to Google and and you you put his name in, you'll get you'll get things that uh, have all kinds of dates associated with them. But the actual data um, was uh, was uh, repeated and and reprinted again and again from the early 1970s, 60s, and 70s. So the uh, character and the life and the history of George McJunkin needs an update. So that's the other sort of applied anthropo anthropological uh, problem that I face is trying to figure out how to update the story. So my slides are going to work a little bit backwards tonight. I'm sort of beginning at the present and working back in time. I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, and then hopefully, um, if you have questions, we'll answer them at the end. Um, 
The work began in 2021 when I went to the Pecos conference and said, I'm going to do this work. And then I went to Folsom and talked with the ranchers and the local community and the museum there. And in 2022, we gave a big presentation at the Pecos conference with uh, a bunch of participants. We had a, a special session, a couple hour symposium. We presented a lot of, lot of information about George. We had a number of people participating. I call them Team McJunkin. And that team is a more, uh, loosely affiliated group of people who come and go. And so I have new members. I have members who have dropped off the team. But we've been working on this in uh, 21 and 2022. And uh, recently in 2023, just a few weeks ago, uh, we submitted a proposal to uh, the Kiva to uh, publish a themed volume on George McJunkin. Uh, Team McJunkin members would contribute and uh, we would go through the process. So we're thinking that when we hear back from the um, editors, we'll get writing and maybe in about a year or a year and a half, we're gonna have a theme volume uh, in the Kiva. There's also some other pieces of things floating around. I wrote a, a, a short letter to the Colorado Archaeological Society newsletter earlier this summer in June and July. It was published online and on websites and it's readily available and you can read it. It's about 2,700 words. It describes the project. And I'll be glad to share it with you later. You can contact me and I'll, be, I'll send you a copy if you haven't seen it. So there's things that you can read. We've been publishing little pieces or writing little pieces uh, the past couple of years and we have some of that floating around. We also have that proposal for the Kiva that we can share more widely once the proposal has been accepted by the editors. So uh, I keep saying that I want people to think about this project as a capacity building exercise. It's a, it's a exercise, it's archeology, span but it's an exercise to um, look at uh, the future. We have uh, earth sciences field school idea in mind. We don't know if we'll get there or not, but one of the reasons why we wanna do that is because there's a real and perceived uh, shortage of personnel in cultural resource management archeology span and students are not getting trained to become professional archeologists. So a field school would uh, help that. There's lots of field schools around, but this one would be for black indigenous people of color and anyone else who wants to come study historical archeology, span uh, an area in the Southwest that is sometimes uh, underappreciated and underutilized. Um, we're using George McJunkin because George McJunkin was already famous as a cowboy and as a discoverer of the Folsom site. And people are just enthralled with George. And so uh, building on his fame and his reputation, we can get a lot of more people interested in archeology span and maybe a few of them would wanna become professional archeologists in the future. So that's sort of the uh, applied anthropology aspect of it. It's really sort of a business case proposition. How do you get more people into this profession and diversify the data that we're using and, and, and get uh, a larger uh, uh, bit of action going on. Um, the other thing I've been calling this is um, uh, a bit of a thought experiment. So it's very standard archeology span or archeological practices that I've been engaged in, but my thinking uh, is, and while my thinking is normative in many ways, I'm trying to give up some of that to uh, think about how we can upgrade George McJunkin's story and, uh, and how we use these archeological sites, which present some really unique problems, um, especially uh, the recent trend in archeology span over the past 30 years, 30 years is to do anti-colonial archeology span or decolonizing archeology. span And that raises some great issues. If you're trying to get more people involved and let them have a voice and let them lead the program and develop the research, um, how do you do that with uh, someone like George McJunkin, who was a black cowboy who was interested in sciences and archeology, span but he clearly was uh, in Folsom to work with the ranchers and with the colonists and make money. And he wanted to be part of the community. He wasn't separate from the community. So he, um, he presents some interesting sort of methodological and theor theoretical challenges for the way we as anthropologists and archeologists uh, try to understand and, and model archaeological resources and, and people and cultures. Um, uh, at, the, at the top of this talk, uh, Al Dart made a land acknowledgement 
And uh, I typically do that also. Uh, of course, OPAC, uh, Old Pueblo is in Tucson. Uh, I live in Flagstaff and I happen to be in Lehigh, Arizona right now, uh, immediately adjacent to the uh, uh, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And um, my work in Folsom is uh, a site that uh, in, in, the, in the town of Folsom is a location where there's a site that is a Paleo Indian site that dates back 10 to 11,000 years. And then uh, in more recent times, there was a lot of trade between the Comanche on the plains and the Pueblo people uh, along the Rio Grande and some of the easternmost Pueblos. So we have a long history of uh, Native American and then uh, others coming in and using this land. Of course, the Santa Fe Trail goes right through my research project area. So we, we have a great deal of history there and uh, all of them from Paleo Indians to Plains and Pueblo tribes to Hispanos, Mexicans and black and white Americans have been involved and uh, they all should have a hand in how we develop this research. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, archeologists that work this land in North America have been doing archeological work since about the time of Th Thomas Jefferson. So that's only 240, 250, 270 years, whatever, whatever that is. And um, it's a very, very, very short time period. So we have a lot to learn because there's thousands of years of prehistory and we barely scratched the surface here. So I'd like to go to my slides and I don't want you to try to read the small print. It's there as sort of a gestalt. I want you to just look at the slide and listen. The most important thing is probably the words at the top of the slide that you can read easily. And um, I'll just sort of give you a feel for what's going on. Uh, uh, Old Pueblo great, made that great little um, uh, image for me on the left using a historical photo that's in the public domain. That's George McJunkin on the left on his horse. Uh, he's a cowboy and uh, a rancher. So cows are involved in all of this and horses are involved in all of this. And on the right is just the email that I'd like to show you that we sent to the editors of the Kiva saying, hey, we have a proposal ready. We submitted it on September 11th. We're waiting to hear back from them so that we, we can begin putting together our, our themed volume on George. On the next slide, I told you about some of these things. We've been intimately tied to uh, the Pecos Conference. I proposed this project in 2021, but there's some other ties to the conference. And that is that uh, there's some anniversary dates that are involved and uh, you'll hear about those here in a few minutes. We went to the Pecos Conference in 2023 and I had a very small session at the end of Friday uh, during the conference. I had like 10 minutes to talk about what we were doing. In 2022, I had two or three hours. Now I'm down to 10 minutes at the Pecos conference. So our window's getting narrower in terms of these sorts of presentations and we're getting more into the writing. Uh, the Pecos conference was in 1927 in late August. And that was exactly the same time frame that the Folsom site discovery was being um, um, set aside and held for the archeologists to leave the Pecos Conference and go to Folsom and verify the finds. So around August 29th, 2027, Kidder and others were at Folsom and they verified the find establishing that early man had been in the world, uh, new world much longer than anyone an anticipated. Um, so we have that kind of anniversary coming up, but we have others as well. Um, the one thing that's really interesting when we start talking about, let me go back here. When we start talking about, I'm sorry, George McJunkin is that there's a young George McJunkin and there's an old George McJunkin. And you, if you're gonna go look on Google uh, or read any of the books or any of the stories, what you wind up reading about is the old George McJunkin. He's an old man, he's been around for years. He finds the Folsom site. He does great things in the community. And uh, it's the old guy. We know very little about the young Jun McJunkin. We know that he was born a slave in 1851. Uh, we know that he was emancipated in Juneteenth in Texas. And uh, he decided that he was going to go west. The parts of the story that are missing is that there were other things going on in America at the same time. There was, uh, at the end of the Civil War, there was just a real economic depression. There were other depressions in the 1870s and 1890s. 
that sent people uh, traveling around the country. Well, George was, uh, you know, caught up in a lot of those things, and he moved west to try to make a living. Uh, but the young McJunkin uh, is an interesting character. We'd like to know more about him. So I went down to Madisonville, Texas, uh, just a, a couple weeks ago, uh, or maybe 10 days ago, uh, uh, se uh, September 10th. And um, uh, I went looking for the young George McJunkin. There's McJunkins buried in historic cemeteries there. And on the right, you see a headstone. There's a McJunkin, J.R. McJunkin. And he is born in 1849 and died in 1911. And there's several other McJunkins. And, and these people in the, in the cemetery at uh, Rogers Prairie are not uh, black. It's a white cemetery. They're white McJunkins. And they're probably the children or the nieces and nephews of the slave owner that once owned George and his father. Um, and so uh, I'm looking for the McJunkin farm or the homestead where, where they lived, because it's probably in um, Midway, Texas, about 20 miles from where these headstones are located. So it's interesting to me that we have a lot of McJunkins uh, in the area where George came from and where he got his name, uh, but we know uh, only a little bit about them. You can find some of the headstones on Find a Grave and other places if you do gene genealogical research and you discover things, I'd be glad to hear about it because I don't do that type of research. Um, but I'm looking to find out more about the young George McJunkin. The paper in the center of the slide there is the Madison County Historical Society slide where you can request information. And I'm in the process of filling out several of those forms and sending them some money to see if I can get them to do some records research. But uh, Miss Cannon, who's the museum curator there in, in Madisonville told me that the county courthouse had in, in, in that county has burned down five or six or seven times. And so it's unclear whether we're gonna be able to get the records or not, but there's some way that we're gonna find out about the young George McJunkin because we're gonna be able to find it on an old map where it locates their farmstead or their homestead. Uh, we're we're going to find something that point, or land records or something that can get us in the direction where we can learn more about George. Uh, other people have been down to the cemetery before, uh, but I've made the connection here. The new thing is is that the the dates on the headstones uh, indicate that the people uh, uh, in those graves in that cemetery were contemporaneous with George. They weren't his superiors or subordinates, they, they were children the same time George was a child and they grew up and died and are buried. They stayed in Midway and Madisonville and Rogers Prairie and never left the area, probably because they had ties to the land. And George left because he was a freed man and he had no ties to land. He was gonna go out and make his way somewhere else. So over on the right, um, there's a nice article there that Mrs. Uh, Cannon wrote about George McJunkin in March, I, in May, excuse me. And I read the article and it's great because she uh, goes into some new information that I didn't know about some of these graves. And I've had several conversations with her. I had a conversation with her this afternoon and um, I'm trying to uh, uh, solicit her support to get more information. And if I had to go back down to um, uh, Midway or Madisonville or Rogers Prairie, it's a, it's a couple day drive to get there, but I'm going to go do some more work there as soon as I can. Uh, her article is really wonderful. I have a copy of it. You can, if you get these slides after the talk, you can probably clip that out and blow it up and read it, but we have copies of it if, if need be. Um, it is new information. Uh, she's written a lot of stuff that's been written elsewhere, but she's added new information. So continuously, we're learning new things about George as we go. And this is information from where he was born and where he grew up. So I'm real excited about that new connection. Um, most of you really know, go back, let's see. Go back. What happened to my slide there? Okay, most of, hmm? most of you know uh, about the old McJunkin who lived in Folsom, New Mexico, and our thought experiment is to try to look at his sites and see what new we can learn about him. Those are pictures of George up there at the top and they're all in the public domain. And the thing that really got me going with this research project was this book down below at the bottom called Black Cowboy by Franklin Folsom. And it, uh, it was published in 1974 and it's sort of a thin book. 
It's written for maybe high school students. It's written in a novelistic way, and it sort of blends a lot of the dates and times together in a way that it jumps around back and forth and in space and time. And um, you're sort of left confused because as an archeologist, because there's not a really clear direct timeline in the book that you can follow. It, it skips a bit, around a bit, but it tells the story of George coming to Folsom and why he was such a great guy, what he did for the community, how well he was respected and treated in the community, some of the adventures he went on and him finding the site at Folsom and then trying to get the archeologists involved in it. Uh, he found the site in 1908. He tried to get people involved in it. He died in 1922, and the archaeologists didn't really start working on it uh, till after he was dead and gone. So it's a it's an interesting little story. But the thing in the book that got me um, sort of irritated as an archaeologist, you know, I'm sitting there trying to read it dispassionately and just enjoy it. And then there's a chapter in there where they talk about George having a cabin with all of his stuff in it including his samples and his collections from the Folsom site. And the cabin burns down after it was struck by lightning and everything was destroyed. And that's where the chapter stops. And I'm sitting there as an archeologist thinking, darn it, where's the stuff? You know, uh, you don't tell me anything about the stuff. So if a cabin is burned down with stuff in it, it's, it's in the ground at the site where the cabin existed. It's not destroyed, it's not obliterated, it's there in the ground. The archeologist would say, let's go see the stuff. And the book doesn't cover any of his stuff after it became uh, archaeological. Well, I said, well, damn, I'm going to go to Folsom and I'm going to go look at the stuff. So that's the new thing about this research. I'm going to look at his historical sites and the artifacts that are associated with them to see what's there and what, what is it that we can do with them. So some of the impetus for this work came from that book. And if you get a hold of it and read it, it's really fun. It's a fun read. But uh, if you're a professional archaeologist listening to this tonight, there are times when you're going to come up with other questions uh, about uh, what's going on. Uh, so drive over to Folsom with my wife and my dog. There's my, my dog side of my field crew at the Folsom site. We're out looking at materials. Um, and then we had other crew members along the way. We've had a number of team members come and go. Uh, this last May, we had the three young archaeologists uh, join the crew. And uh, they went out and surveyed with me. And one of the reasons having them along was so great was because I could listen to them, um, you know, uh, talk about artifacts and look at things on the ground and look at landscapes and spatial relationships and talk about them. And I could hear things that might verify what I was thinking or what I knew or what I had seen. But I also discovered that they were saying things that I had not considered and things that I did not know. Or, or and and it just really opened my eyes to to listen to them because they really gave me some good insights into the things that um, they knew through their training or things that I was missing and it just helps round out the project to have a lot of young people and have a lot of different people coming out looking at the sites with you to get uh, an impression. So archaeologists do that all the time. We did that here. Here you see them uh, in the top center at George McJunkins Blacksmith Shop that little uh, uh, piece of ground with the sort of an L-shaped uh, white uh, foundation. There's uh, handmade tools and things laying all over the place. There may be some depth to it, but we don't know. There's a, a cow pasture on top of it and it's been disturbed a little bit, but it's there and there's lots of great artifacts. George was a horseman and he took care of horses and trained horses. And this is a place where he probably worked on a regular basis. His father had been a blacksmith down in Midway, Texas, and so he had learned blacksmithing as well as all those other horsey skills. And uh, this little shop right here may have a wealth of information. The interesting thing about that site is, is that immediately adjacent to it, there's, there's other sites. I think I have another picture of it nearby turned around in the other direction. And there are sites on top of sites, historic sites on top of historic sites. And so being able to sort things out spatially, both in time and depth and in across distances on the ground there is going to be a, an important thing to do. So we basically have multi-component sites, which you wouldn't think about for a cowboy, but in fact, we have them. Um, they're standing in front of a stone house there and um, we're sharing a meal together. So we, we had a lot of fun and we're doing some great work um, really traditional archeological survey and discussion about what's going on. Here's some of uh, things that are, are available in the local community. 
Um, the slide in the center is really interesting. George McJunkin built a house in Folsom as an old George McJunkin, and the house still stands. And I'm actually underneath the house looking under the crawl space. And you can see there's all sorts of stuff in there. Some of it might be more modern, but we don't know how far back in time the stuff is in that crawl space underneath. It's never been uh, excavated. It's never been investigated. Uh, that I've, I actually have not been inside the house because it's privately owned and the owner said we could walk on the property, but we couldn't go into the house at the time we were working there. So we have some preliminary ideas about that house and how it's built and why it's built and where it's built. And we'd like to learn more about it. So not only do we get to do historic archaeology in the ground, but we get to look at historic architecture as well. Another example is on the right. This is a cabin uh, on a ranch that George lived at. He lived in this cabin. And this is typical of the cabins out there. It's a wooden cabin. It has metal cladding on the exterior. Some of it's been removed. And of course, the roof is damaged here. But this is the type of cabin that George had built um, and was storing all the stuff in when it was struck by lightning and all the stuff burned to the ground, the story that I just mentioned a few moments ago. So it looks like this. Um, and there's artifacts all around it on the ground. And it's never been excavated. It's never been recorded, but it's there. So you have, you have a architectural history of sort of uh, organic structures and you have uh, the materials in the ground that may be related to George's occupation, later occupations. Uh, the pile of stuff down here, this is probably the, the cladding on the side of the cabin of the cabin that burned, but I'm not quite sure yet. We found this spot. Uh, there's growth on top of the big mesquites growing on top of it, but this is probably the remains of his cabin, I'm thinking, but I'll have to do some work to verify it, and I'll have to talk with the rancher some more. So we have things that we've not seen before or investigated, but there they are. You can see the difference between uh, a rusted... Um, metal structure, and then when it gets burned, you see the color change there. So that's the first clue. Um, we also have at the site where the cabin burned down, there's a piece of a rock wall and there's a, there's a depression there. There might be a root cellar or something going on there that was related to George's occupation of, uh, of that site. And uh, he stored a chuck wagon there at one time and people used to come up and he cooked dinner for folks and things like that. A lot of different activities going on on this site. He would he would use that site to provision his chuck wagon when he would go out on trail rides with the cowboys to herd horses. So and there's there's lots of um, artifacts scattered on the surface and maybe there's some depth to it too. And the interesting thing is uh, we can learn more about the types of provisions at this site compare them to the types of provisions we might see at sites in town, and we get a difference between like out on the ranch a few miles out of town and what's going on in town. So we have some comparative bases as archeologists to look at the artifacts and make some comments about um, what we think is going on. Uh, the other types of resources we have in Folsom related to historical old McJunkin are cemeteries. There's uh, George's headstone is in the cemetery. And I had a funny uh, exercise with that, trying to figure out why it was at the back of the cemetery. And uh, when you walk in the back of the cemetery, he's the first person you see, but the, the cemetery gate was originally far away at the other end of the cemetery. And formation processes uh, uh, rear their head and tell us that things are always changing all around us. So George was once buried at the back of the cemetery. Now he's the first, first guy you see and you walk in and it's all because the road was paved nearby in 1958. And I have the aerial photos that show the road being paved. So, once the road was paved, they changed the cemetery, and then George became the, the, the first person you see when you walk in the gate. There's other cemeteries in Folsom. There's, this, George is in the Protestant cemetery. There's a Catholic cemetery, and there's Hispanic uh, Catholics buried in the cemetery. And this is one of the graves. It's, it's an unusual treatment. The entire grave is covered with glass, broken glass. And it's, there's a couple of them in the cemetery. I don't know what it means, but we have some really unusual graves and things. And so if we're looking at... Uh, graves and spatial patterns and mortuary analysis. We have a lot of work to do because we have those two cemeteries. And then the third one up at the top is a boot hill. The interesting thing about Folsom, if you go look at a map, uh, there's two cemeteries on any map you can look at. But there's a third cemetery that's never recorded, never reported. Everybody in town knows it exists, but it doesn't exist on any of the maps. Because this is where they put uh, people who were murdered, violent men, uh, children who were uh, 
unbaptized and died in birth or, or soon after, and, and strangers that died in Bolton, they didn't know who they were. So this is the stranger cemetery. It's not marked on any of the maps, but there, there may be 300 people up in this, up in this cemetery and, and nobody has ever investigated it. So um, we have these three cemeteries and they form a triangle around Folsom and they, uh, that sort of the, creates the sacred space of, around the community and then everything outside of those cemeteries is out on the ranches. Uh, again, some pictures. This here's the George's um, blacksmith shop, and then there's a house over here that's sort of a kid house from Sears or one of those companies back in 19 teens, 20s. But underneath this house, there's probably an earlier occupation, an earlier house, historic house. So the earlier occupation is probably the one that George McJunkin was involved with, and then this was put on later. Um, so we have to sort that out still. Uh, the blacksmith shop is very close nearby. Here again is George's cabin. And the interesting thing about this photo is you look at it, it has a little steel chimney on the south side and there's no, it's made out of native stone. There's no brick, but you go inside, there's brick up inside the ceiling and you find some brick laying around on the ground outside of it. So you go around to these houses Sometimes they, on the exterior, they don't show any brick, but then you find brick laying around and you realize that there's brick hidden inside the structure. Uh, this is a fire protection as the chimney pipe goes up to the ceiling. Um, go back here. As the chimney pipe goes up to the ceiling. This is George's house that I was just showing you a moment ago underneath it. And we, he built an adobe house with an American roof, he said, because he wanted to be uh, dry and have security in his old age. He never really got to live in it because he got sick and he died before he could he could live in it. Uh, but he he may have had a little bit of time in there, and we'd have to investigate the property around it to uh, figure out you know if there are out buildings or uh, other features that might reveal more about George and his community. Uh, this picture is at the XYZ Ranch, and when I, you go to Folsom, they pull out this picture and they show it to you, and they say this shows you that George was well-educated. Lived with all his books and his instruments and his equipment. And then they say all this stuff got caught in the fire and burned down. So I was expecting, I was focused on this fireplace right here. And I was expecting to uh, see bricks at the place where the cabin burned down. And it turns out that this is on one ranch and the cabin that burned down is on another ranch. But somehow the story gets sort of pressed together or, or twist it together and they show you this photo and they tell the story and it's, it's really two different places. Um, and so you have to be really careful with historic photos and documents because you'll, you'll, when you talk with uh, the local ranchers in the community, um, you get a generalized story and then you have to sort of pick it apart to find out you know, what piece belongs with what, what photo, what map belongs with what story and how does it work? Uh, because it's not always clear to anyone. They think they're telling the story as accurately as can be, and you realize that things have uh, timelines and ideas have co coalesced together, and you have to you have to pull it apart. Now, the other thing that was going on with George is he was moving across the landscape. I'm going to show you a couple of things because maps are important in this kind of research, and I would encourage all of you to find any and all kinds of maps that you can find, and then you ask the question. In my particular case, the question is, how would this map inform me about George McJunkin being a cowboy or about the community of Folsom. And you get all types of maps from all different eras and, and go through that exercise. So uh, back in 1850, 1853, that little strip up there that's part of Oklahoma was a neutral strip. There was a uh, battle going on in Congress between slave states and free states and, and disputed areas. And that little panhandle occurred um, uh, uh, because of those disputes. And then it later became Oklahoma up here. Uh, when Texas uh, claimed it, but then became independent, they had to give it away and it became Oklahoma. Well, Folsom is right over here to the west of that panhandle in New Mexico and close to Colorado. And so George is moving from south of Dallas here at Midway and, and uh, Madisonville and Rogers Prairie where his family is, he's moving from down here all the way up over this direction. As a young man, he's working throughout this whole region, this Llano Estacado, the State Plains. He's working 
in in uh, along the Arizona, excuse me, the New Mexico Texas border, and up into Colorado and Kansas. He's working this whole region, and he finally settles here. He's in an area. He's he's in an area that's disputed, and my feeling is these maps tell me something that because these areas are disputed and they're in contention. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, make a living because just because of that issue. If there's some dispute going on in Congress today, you know that somebody's probably making money off of it because it's a dispute. Well, the same idea applies to the landscape. If if these boundaries are changing, if these communities are changing, if these ideas about control and structure are changing, then there's an opportunity as a cowboy or as a businessman or as a railroad person or as a homesteader to, to move in and, and make a living uh, uh, at that border or at that change. And so looking at these maps doesn't tell me anything about George in specific, except that it gets me thinking about, well, what are those changes and how is he making a living? There's other things going on out in the region. There's a really great little book uh, by uh, Blackshear, uh, James Blackshear, uh, called Confederates and Comancheros, and he has a video on YouTube, and you can go look it up, and it's a great little video. He's giving a talk to an audience, and he describes what's in his book, but basically there was a whole system set up um, when the uh, Mexicans were in charge of New Mexico um, to, to trade with the Comancheros, and the people would get permits in Santa Fe and, and go out and trade on the plains back and forth. And we're talking about the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. So there's a whole system going on back and forth east to west with, with, this, with this trade. And this is a wonderful little story of, about how um, people were making money and, and engaged in skullball, skullduggery and double dealing, uh, just as I was saying, because it was an ill-defined area. And George is riding right through this area a little bit later coming in He's not in the wilderness. He's in an area that's well known to everybody and it's operating in different ways at different times. These folks are doing permits and trading with Comancheros. George is coming in with the big cattle uh, crews after the 1860s and moving cattle north to the railroads to get them to market in the east. Uh, so different economic systems overlapping one another, leaving sites behind and leaving trails and, and, um, and vestiges of, of, of their systems. And George is making himself available to all of us in different ways working within his community. So this story has nothing to do with George. This book has nothing to do with George, except it's a prelude to you know, what George was running into when he finally showed up. Let's see. There's other people out uh, in the Western US and it's an exciting time for archaeologists and historians because George stands out as this black cowboy who's interested in science and discovers the Folsom site. And he's described as this unique individual. He's like the only black guy in Folsom and he's one of a kind and all that. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of these black individuals who are one of a kind in different communities all over the West. And um, uh, the interesting thing is they're starting to come to light. Historians are writing about them. And these sorts of individuals uh, are, you can think of it like they're nails that are standing up that needed to be pounding down. So the historians have pounded down on them and they've come up with some really great information. And uh, now they're starting to uh, be, there's starting to be enough information that uh, we can compare individuals and how they were operating in their landscapes and how they were dealing with things like racial issues and, and uh, uh, cultural appropriation and uh, just general work and making a living. And, and we have some basis of, of uh, comparison now. And we didn't really have that before. The, these individuals weren't, be weren't being written about so much a few years ago. So we've got a lot more data out there. Um, Bass Reeves was a lawman, another one of those individuals. And then we have something interesting going on that just happened in November. There was a book published called uh, the first black archaeologist, the life of John Wesley Gilbert. And um, Dr. Lee here published this book last November. I have a copy of it. And it's great because it tells the story of uh, John Wesley Gilbert growing up in the eastern U.S., uh, going to 
school, going to college, getting uh, involved in archaeology, going to Greece and working as a professional archaeologist in Greece. He's a real archaeologist. He's the first black archaeologist. And it was really uh, uh, amazing to me when I saw this book, I had to go grab it because George McJunkin found the site in Folsom in 1908 and tried to get people interested. Uh, he never was able to sell a bone collection or anything like that. He died. And later the archaeologist came in and excavated the site and made the great find. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, people started calling George McJunkin an archaeologist, and he really isn't. So we have something comparative here. We can look at the life of John Wesley Gilbert and all of the details on how and when and why and where he became an archaeologist. And we can compare him with George McJunkin now. We have some really wonderful comparisons that we can make. But it's really clear that this guy is the first archaeologist and George is not. George is a black ranch foreman. And um, so when people say that George was an archaeologist, um, he, he, he might be an avocational archaeologist, what we would call it today, but he was a, he was a cowboy. So now in, also in New Mexico, uh, a new book has come out about the town of Blackdom, which is a couple hundred miles south of Folsom. And the book was written by Timothy Nelson based on his dissertation. And Timothy Nelson, Dr. Nelson is a, is a, is a black historian. And he's written this wonderful book about the town of Blackdom in the 18, late uh, 19 teens and 1920s and early 30s and how black um, members of a uh, community elsewhere moved to New Mexico and created a community uh, in New Mexico and then moved on. Uh, well, here you now have a black community trying to thrive and exist and live as farmers and, and some cattle and things like that in Southern New Mexico. And you have a community. Um, and so what's now interesting to me is as an archeologist is I need to go down to see that with Timothy, with Dr. Nelson and, and look at the artifacts, look at the site layout, look at the things that are going on there and start to imagine how any of that compares with a city or a town like Folsom where there's only one black man in the town and he's living in a white community and how those communities vary. So there's a comparative database there that we can start to put together now that these books have come out. These are brand new books and uh, it's an exciting time to be looking at George McJunkin because there's a lot of comparative information at different scales and different locations, but it all seems to be related in some way. Uh, the thing that I would encourage you to do after this talk is to get David Meltzer's books. One is called Folsom, and it's about the Folsom site and the excavations. And I think it was published around 2005, the University of Chicago. And then there was a later book in 2015 called The Great Paleolithic War. And if you ever want to see some of the best writing in science and in archaeology, these two books have, it's just, it's just fabulous writing. And uh, it's a type of stuff that um, um, is not easy to get through because you have to pay attention. But it's, it's wonderful stuff. And uh, I hope and aspire that we can write our um, articles for our journal, uh, uh, our, our theme journal on George McJunkin, as well as these two books. But these two books will give you the full story on the Folsom excavation and uh, George's role in it. He covered, he's in there seven or eight pages worth of stuff about George, but they also come to the conclusion that book that George wasn't an archeologist, he, he simply discovered the site. Um, and we see that also in some other articles and you see Atlas Obscura here and Discover Magazine. Stephen Nash and I have been having a conversation about does George McJunkin really have any value to archeology span because why does he deserve more credit? Well, Stephen is interested in um, the history of archeology span and the history of science. So he is interested in the issue of who gets credit and who doesn't. I don't think it's really an important issue. I'm looking at, if I'm looking at George and his archeological sites, I think his archeological sites have value in their own right. So I'm avoiding in all of my work, I've been avoiding the Folsom site and the Folsom excavations because that's a whole different thing. That's Paleo-Indian stuff. And I'm really looking at historical archeology span to learn more about George's life 
uh, about an individual, which is a difficult thing to do in archaeology, and I'm trying to learn about the community of Folsom. So George is a hidden figure in North American archaeology, but he's really, he's a cowboy. That's why he's a hidden figure. So people obsess over this, but you have to realize that um, it was a different time and different place. There wasn't anything uh, that we call today an avocational archaeologist. So it was really important in the 50s and 60s to give George more credit, but that's not really where we need to go. We need to tell an alternate story. Uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and even today, we have people starting to tell the alternate story. George Agagino really was the guy that helped promote um, uh, George getting credit. And he was at uh, Eastern New Mexico University and did a lot of Paleo Indian work. And so he also collected a lot of George's artifacts. You can go to Google Scholar or any other source and type in his name and you can find old articles that he's written and things about George. There's lots of other stuff he's published in journals and you need to go look and read if you want to read more. And you can follow it. You can create a timeline and follow George's story through time and how it changes. Uh, more recently, uh, we have George showing up in, in American Antiquity and in SAA publications there and talking about George um, and how he's become a role model or, or not and, and what that means. And so this is the thing that is a little bit confusing for archaeologists. George really isn't an archaeologist, but he's a role model for archaeologists. So it's, uh, to me, it's sort of tenuous. And like I said, I'm not, a lot of people are involved in giving him credit or recognizing him as an early archaeologist. I think I want to study George uh, and his sites because they're unique in and of themselves. The sites are now over 100 years old because he died in 1922. So they're historical archaeological sites and we can lo learn more about George's, the word I keep using is learning more about George's quotidian life. So here we are. We, we have a guy, George McJunkin, famous old McJunkin, and we have the barely known young McJunkin, uh, two, different, two different creatures. And my uh, object of anthropological analysis is that ordinary life, the quotidian life. George is still in Folsom. His sites are still there, but he's also in Midway, Texas. Uh, the interstitial Western spaces between those two points in time we don't know what's out there about the George, the young George McJunk, and that stuff's hard to find. It's undocumented. He was not famous. He was not well known. He did not have a reputation. He may have left stuff behind. He may have lived at sites all across that region. Uh, even as you know, cowboys move around a lot, he may have been sedentary at certain parts in time. But finding that stuff and dealing with it, we don't know anything about it at this point in time. So where are the records, where's the stuff? We we don't know. It may show up. We'll see things in old newspapers or in old publications or in old land records where, where George appears because he could read and write and he created a lot of records as an older George. So we need to re be researching local archives um, to learn more about that early side of George. Uh, we're gonna need permission from the ranchers and private landowners. I want you to know that all the work that we've been doing and doing survey and looking at George's sites has been on private land. We've not gone on state land uh, and we've gotten permission from the ranchers and their cooperation. It's been very wonderful. So it's a, this whole project is an exercise in cooperation. We did no digging and we had no permits. We're only leaving footprints. We went out and did basically pedestrian survey. We did no collections. We made very little minimal mapping at this point in time. Uh, but we did use some off-the-shelf tools that were cheap and effective. So there's, uh, there's an app that you can put on your phone. It's called OnX. And it is an app that hunters use to locate themselves on the ground. We were using apps like that that you just download for free and you can figure out you know, where you are on the ground and it will give you uh, details that you don't see in some other mapping apps. And uh, if you look at um, George from the hunter's perspective, you those just like if you look at different maps at different points in time, you get different questions to ask. If you look at like hunting apps and think about George and what he's doing on that land, those hunting apps may raise new questions. It's a different technology, it raises new questions. So at this point in time, I think the George McJunkin story is 170 years old when he was born, or he's 172 now, I think. Uh, 100 years old when he died, 1922, or it's 50 years old when the uh, Folsom 
or uh, uh, 50 years old when the the, um, the Folsom site was excavated. Now it's 25 years old when uh, Franklin Folsom's book was published. So we have all these different Georges at different points in time, and we have to pick them apart. Uh, so my goal is to look at the alternate story in a complementary way to all this other stuff, especially to the Folsom site work, and, and make some use of Georgia's historical sites and, and Western spaces. Uh, again, uh, we're going through the archives. We're looking at different maps at different points in time, uh, aerial photos, older maps, uh, GLO and, and state land maps. And, and, and sometimes by looking at a series of maps over time, you learn different things. So on one map, you'll get something that it's hard to interpret. You'll look at the next map and you'll discover that there's a spring there that isn't on the other map, or there's some there's a recording there, something mentioned there that isn't on the other map. So you wind up um, going through the archives and looking at a wide variety of maps to try to figure out what to do about George. We did some work in 2022 on his homestead. I went up there. Few people have ever been up to his homestead, but he patented a piece of land and lived there. I worked with Brenda Wilkinson from the BLM, and we did a presentation at the Pecos Conference. We've learned a great deal about the people who lived there and worked with George. We have more work to do on that. So records are very important. We go out and we find all sorts of artifacts uh, that are useful to us. Uh, here's a glass bottle. I've shown you this picture before, but it's a Mississippi Glass Company, um, St. Louis, Missouri, 1870, probably. 1870 to 1880. And it's been curated at the site where George's cabin was for a much longer period of time than 1870 to 1880. A lot of artifacts like that with different sorts of dates on it. Interestingly, one of the cowboys showed me some stuff he'd collected off the site and he has nails and buckles and razor blades and stuff like that. Um, I'm always curious as to whether some technology, uh, let me go back here. I'm always curious as to whether some technology can, you know, get blood residue out of artifacts like that that could be used for DNA analysis. Uh, these probably not have been handled by everybody, but there's technologies that are out there that if you get the right artifacts at the right time in the right context, you could probably do some really wonderful things. These corrals here are the remnant corrals. These corral, corrals in Folsom extended way out across this pasture. There's all sorts of features buried in the ground here. We know very little about cowboys and how they worked and how they camped and lived on this uh, piece of land as they were uh, uh, putting cows into pens and getting them on the train to go to market. But there's a there's a whole site out there that's worthy of ex exploration if you're looking at George and his cohorts. George lived in houses and there's sketches of them. And here's the man's room where George lived. Um, he lived with the family, taught the children how to uh, uh, ride horses and, and rope, and, and in exchange for that, they taught him how to read and write or read and write better, and uh, he was proud to be part of that family, so the story goes, but when you look at the sketch of the house, he's, his room is on the back of the house, there's no direct entry into the house, he has to enter and leave this room from the out of doors. Does that mean anything significant? We don't know. It might just be a shotgun house, and that's the way an ad a room was added on. Uh, it could mean something more. People will debate it. And so these sorts of records are useful for people to compare notes and, 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 and have discussions. George, George was very famous. His material culture, I think, is all about uh, reputation. He bought some of the fanciest gear you could ever have. Uh, this is a spring up at his homestead. He built a, 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 a box around the spring that uh, is, is still in the ground and still working. Uh, his craftsmanship is exceptional. Uh, here he is in a picture up on the left, a uh, public domain picture of playing polo in Folsom in 1903. Uh, so he was a man of many talents, but he, he was a horse guy. He traveled through time and space on a horse with really excellent equipment and, and high value equipment. So he was um, creating a reputation, you know, by dressing well and showing that, uh, he, he had the material wealth and knowledge to, to be the top cowboy in town. And he was letting everybody know that he was the top cowboy in town. So these artifacts tell us a lot about George and we may be able to learn more. We barely scratched the surface here. We've, we've only done a very good analysis of what this battle is. And we, we need to learn more about it. We just, just
just haven't had the time to do it yet. Um, so I think George McJunkin, if you want to, as an archaeologist, if you want to try to start figuring him out, uh, he's all about movement through time and space. He's on a horse. He's traveling from Texas to New Mexico. He's traveling all over the place, doing this and that. He's going everywhere, and he's trying to make his way. Uh, this map shows the distance from the town of Folsom here to out to his homestead. He has about a, and, and the, um, the uh, Folsom site is right here. So here's his homestead, here's the Folsom site, here's the town. And he's back and forth, it's a straight line distance. Uh, and he's back and forth every day. And he's creating obligations and solving problems for people along the way. He can visit the different ranchers along the way. He doesn't have to take that straight line. He can go any direction he wants. And he's crossing different property and jurisdiction. And he's looking at the landscape and he's looking at the cows and he's looking at the resources up on the hills. You know, where's the firewood? Where's the trees? Things like that. So he can, he has knowledge of a landscape from that he's gathered by traveling across the landscape. He intimately knows this landscape and he can tell people in town, I can get you those resources. I can send a couple of cowboys over to cut some wood for you, do this or do that. He knows where the stuff is and he knows how to turn it into economic benefit for himself and the community. So he's all about movement. And what happens is because he's sort of in this area in the after the late 1880s, 1890s, and he's staying here, he's living in little places all over the place. And his stuff is getting trapped at these houses, you know, artifacts are getting discarded and getting trapped. So the old George McJunkin is represented in several sites in this area because he was at all of those sites and, and the artifacts are left behind. So we can look at one individual site or we can look at a landscape scale spatial analysis to start making comparisons. That work hasn't been done yet, but it's things that we can do. And this would be great stuff for field school students to work on. Here's the three cemeteries in Folsom or the town of Folsom. And then here's the Catholic cemetery. Here's the Protestant cemetery where George is buried. And then here's the Boot Hill or the unregistered cemetery where all the violent men are buried. And, and like I said, these two cemeteries show up on the maps. This one, I put it on this map, but it's nowhere on any of the other maps. Um, and so it creates an interesting problem. Like how do you deal with a cemetery like that when you have these other two in town? Um, it, it, one, of a, one of our proposed papers for the volume is going to look at mortuary analysis um, on the surface of these cemeteries, and uh, we may be able to tell you more about that in the near future. Uh, again, movement across time and space. George went from Rogers Prairie and from Mid, uh, 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 Midway, Texas, up to Folsom. That's 600 miles as a crow flies, but his and, and then, you know, where he was born to where this, where his, uh, where the white McJunkins are buried is 20 miles. They only got a short distance. George, they went 20 miles. George went 600 miles, uh, got himself buried up here in Folsom. And he covered this whole area throughout here. So there's all kinds of things that we can do with the stories that we know about George and trying to relate them to landscapes and to sites. When you look at maps again, I said that you have to think about how they fit George or how George fits them. Uh, here's Folsom, New Mexico, right up here. Uh, clearly, we're outside of the Pueblo cultural sphere. We're at the edge of the southwestern arc, southwestern culture area, and we're on Comancheria and a, a large range where there was trade, horse trade going back and forth between New Mexico and and the Llano Estacado. And George delivers with his cowboys, black cowboys and Mexican cowboys, delivers cattle up the New Mexico state line, up into Colorado and Kansas to get them to market. And so uh, there's lots of different people interacting out here. And um, uh, George certainly uh, probably interacted with all of them. Uh, here is another of the state land maps. And uh, the interesting thing about this is again, here's Folsom. He's traveling back and forth every day. And I think the Franklin Folsom book sort of mentions that George is out traveling around the community looking for things. Um, that's how he found the Folsom site. So what do we know about George McJunkin that's new? We, we went out and looked at a site that had never been excavated. They've never been collected formally. They've never been mapped formally. We're just 
everybody in town knows where they are. The ranchers can show me where they are. And so I didn't discover anything new. I'm just, they're taking me out and showing me, well, this is where, you know, George's cabin was. Okay, thank you very much. And we go out and we look at the map. We say, oh, there's, here's where his homestead is. Let's go find it. We go out and find it. So we're not really doing much discovery, but we're looking at the artifacts on the sites. And what do we, what do we know about George McJunkin? What is new in this process the last couple of years? Well, I think uh, George is misunderstood by historians and archeologists. And we tend to believe he's someone who's only tangentially related to our discipline. Uh, but, you know, and that's because of the Folsom site, but that's only one dimension. So George is famous for the right reason for finding the Folsom site and trying to promote it, but he's also famous for the wrong reason because that keeps him separated from professional archeologists. They don't wanna deal with him in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s because he's not an archeologist. So the way we deal with it is uh, we look at his material culture and his historical record, and we start to learn some new things. We learn that uh, to George, uh, he's involved in the system. He's trying to be part of the system. He's trying to be with the ranchers. He's joining the Cattlemen's Association. He has personal agency. He knows how to act. He's responsible for himself. He's, uh, you know, all of the his historical stories say that he's brave and bold and all that sort of stuff. But he clearly is, is self-possessed. He has reputation and he demonstrates it. And he has really strong private ownership interests. We're finding out that he, he believed in private property rights and he was going to, you know, make sure that his, his rights were taken care of. So if you wanted to go to the homestead, uh, that's great, and you can come visit, but it was his homestead. And when he decided to sell it, he sold it. He built a house in Folsom, and he sold it, and he made some money off of it. And um, he he had those ownership interests, and he was working with an, esta an established legal system that was growing stronger under the American style of legal ownership uh, over time. He was strongly engaged in deep play. Now, this is something that anthropologists talk about, and if you ever have a chance, go read the Clifford Deert's book about the Balinese cockfight called Deep Play. And, and just read that story. It has nothing to do with George, just a story. But, but look at Geertz's writing and how he talks about people engaging in uh, uh, what they do in life and who makes the, the deep bet and who makes the, the uh, who, who does the deep play and who doesn't and why these different players have different roles. And if you read that story and then go back and think about George McJunkin and look at some of the articles that have been written about him, realize that George is engaged in the same sort of thing that Clifford Geertz was describing in the Balinese cockfight. George was engaged in deep play in this community. He was going to be a member of the community and he was gonna place bets and take action to make things happen because he was interested in reputation. And I think that's what's new about George in all of this work that we're doing. Um, we're gonna get ordinary life with George. We're gonna look at, uh, you know, we can look at things like any inequality, uh, movement through time and space, his reputation. There's lots of things that, that we can do, um, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. The first thing we need to do is write up the initial details that we know and, and then uh, go from there. So a lot of people have, in the earlier writings have missed the bit about George uh, and his horse. Yeah, they say George was a famous cowboy and he knew how to rope and ride, but the, the gift horse that George gave us is, is that um, George was all about movement through the landscape. And if we start looking at his sites and, and the larger landscapes and thinking about how people move across the landscape, we're probably going to get a clearer picture of George, or, or my suspicion is that we're going to get a clearer picture of George. And I think that's where I'm headed with this. Uh, I'm going to seek advice from as many as I can about how to do that work or what it means or you know which, which portions of it have more validity than others. And, and continue on and see where we get. Um, so that's about it. We have um, the book that sort of kicked us all off, uh, The Black Cowboy by Franklin Folsom. At least it kicked it off for me. And uh, then we have, we're at the point now where we're gonna upgrade all of this that I've been talking about tonight with a team of people in uh, the Kiva. And we think George has some lasting power to live on in the annals of Southwestern lore because he's really convincing. And uh, when we start looking at the archeological record, we think that we can advance some scientific knowledge and social knowledge. And we think we can use those sites to bring people into the community 
of archaeology, especially Black Indigenous people of color. So at the bottom of this page, you see we have uh, in our proposal uh, several people who are going to uh, write for the themed volume on George McJunkin and the titles of their papers. This is in consideration right now. It could change, but we're hoping that we get the go ahead to, to do our work. And so Team McJunkin is standing by, excited to, to, to move ahead. And uh, that's all I have. I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Brian. That um, was a wonderful nuanced approach in looking at someone that I think most people involved in Southwestern archaeology are aware of and are aware of his contributions, but really have not had the access to any kind of further knowledge about what his life was like or any of the other ways he interacted with the landscape or the larger community of Folsom or other people in the Southwest. So thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, do you have time for questions and answers, Brian? Sure, I, I ask that they be held to the end because um, it allowed me to get through that. So if you have them recorded, you can ask me them and I'll try to answer them. Okay, um, thank you for everyone who has been here tonight and um, for all of you who have taken the time to be with us. Um, if you have to go, please remember to look at the information about Old Pueblo Archaeology Center. And if you do have an inkling, um, please consider a contribution to all the programs that we do offer at Old Pueblo Archaeology Center. In terms of the questions, um, please feel free to add additional ones at the Q&A or the chat. Um, for those that are that I can see here, um, I'll go through them in the order that they were put up on online. Al, are you seeing any? No, not yet. Um, not yet? Carl, Carl Reynolds has a hands up. Carl, could you put your question or comment in the chat or Q&A, please? And meanwhile, uh, Brian, I have a question. Um, do you see this effort to kind of tease out the, the young George McJunkin through archaeology as maybe a stepping stone to other personalities, um, other minorities, perhaps, in the archaeological record that it might be a new focus for archaeology? Well, I don't know about uh, other personalities, but I think the work is important um, because it makes a bigger tent in archaeology. Perhaps there's somebody out there who's interested in genealogy or in gravestone studies um, and can look at these things, uh, look at these cemeteries, um, and they certainly contribute to our understanding of the McJunkin family, the white McJunkin family and the black McJunkin family. And all of that uh, adds to the historical record, not necessarily the archeological record. But in looking through records and doing research and reading some of these old, um, newspaper stories and journal articles about George. There are little bits and pieces that were remembered and written down. And when they pop out and you've done enough work um, looking looking at the, like George or uh, any, anyone else, you, you discover that there's a piece missing. You discover that there's a clue that there's something else to research. Uh, for example, there's a story in Franklin Folsom's book about George working for a trail master out on the state plains, I believe, um, could be a, in the canyon area around Canyon, Texas, actually. But um, the, the head of the outfit killed an American Indian, Native American, um, a Comanche, and uh, ordered uh, George to bury the body. And George did. And so, you know, the land at that time was contested and there was horse thievery and cattle thievery back and forth and, and conflicts and confrontations and people got killed. So here's an example of, a, of an unknown site. There's a lone burial out there somewhere of an individual that, that ran into the cowboy outfit and, and wound up getting buried in the ground there. Will we ever find that site? It's a, it's a needle in a haystack, one in a million. And why would we want to do it? I'm not really sure. But as an example, um, 
that is the type of thing that you discover when you're reading these stories and it leads you to start asking historical or archaeological questions about well what about the your the the young george mcjunkin or any of his team and what what did he leave behind there's another story where george led a number of men in a winter blizzard and got him into a cabin and saved their lives and they stayed there for days trapped and and then he got them out of there so he was uh hailed as being a great leader and he had he kept his head when everybody else was losing theirs and he he saved all these cowboys where that bunkhouse is or where that little cabin is nobody knows uh, or it's not recorded maybe in 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 someone's notes somewhere but we need to dig and find it because maybe that cabin tells another part of the story so doing that work encourages people to hey i can go out and look at local records in a in a county in texas and see what's there does george does george show up in the record does his name pop up anywhere does the people that he worked for show up there and then th those are clues to you know what might be going on out there whether there are archaeological sites or not that are related to some of that or whether they still exist or never were created in the first place we don't know but uh certainly looking at the historical record like that will um will give us more ideas about how we can deal with the daily life of George, especially the old George McJunkin when he's back in town as an old cowboy. So it looks like we actually do have a question that came up from Elizabeth Salem Benny. Uh, we visited George Mc, uh, McJunkin's grave last week. Who keeps that cemetery up or doesn't? Also, have you read probably Tony Hillerman's take on McJunkin, Othello in Union County? Yeah, uh, the cemetery is owned by the uh, village of Folsom, New Mexico, and uh, the local ranch, you know, the community is very small. There's only about uh, less than 80 people there today. And so a, a lot of things don't happen, but a few things do happen. And uh, they go out every once in a while and they, they, they mow the lawn and cut the weeds down when it gets too overgrown. But that's about the only maintenance that occurs. But the community has been involved with it. The fences are still standing. People come and visit every day. Uh, there was a little piece of property that was donated by one of the local ranchers to create a parking lot. Um, and so nothing much goes on in that cemetery, but they do keep an eye on it and they keep track of it. In fact, George's headstone that's there today is a memorial headstone that is a replacement. His original headstone is probably in the collection at ENMU and, and I heard that George Agagino may have collected it, a wooden headstone. And uh, what, I haven't seen it, but I've heard that it might be around and I have to go looking for it. But somewhere along the line, they they put a put a new headstone in it, and it actually only had, we know the day he was born and the day he died, but all it shows is the years. And they got one of the years wrong on that new headstone. So it's a memorial headstone to show you where he is, but it's inaccurate. So. The, the record gets convoluted that way, but it's a very interesting headstone because people take care of it. Now, the other question was if I uh, had paid attention to Tony Hillerman, and I've read most of Tony Hillerman's stuff, and uh, I didn't really find anything useful for me uh, uh, in Tony Hillerman writing about George, but there's a lot of stuff out there written by a lot of people, and um, it may be useful in the future. I just haven't really incorporated it, incorporated it into any of my work at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, here's an, another question from Carl Reynolds. It says, I have a two part question. Since there was so much speculation about the Folsom site after being assessed by archeologists after George's death, do you think that if George were to have been the one to find the Folsom tips, would this data be more in question due to George being black? And the second part, and if he had been the one to find the Folsom tip, would that make George more regarded as a real archaeologist? Um, I don't think black is the issue here. I think uh, George was, um, it could be, but I don't think so right up front. George was really well respected in his community while he was alive and they loved him and they, they looked out for him and they took care of him. And in fact, I've had some conversations with Dr. Timothy Nelson about that. Uh, and whether or not the Masons were in town. Certainly the railroad comes from town and there's some Mason uh, iconography in the cemetery. 
And Timothy said to me that George went a lot of places and, and traveled quite extensively. And, you know, what gave him the right or the ability to do that? He says he probably had a free pass because of the Masons, because he was in with them. The railroad men and the cattle ranchers were all Masons. And so, uh, and, and George was trying to be part of them. He joined the Cattlemen's Association. So George was well regarded and his race was not an issue so much in, in Folsom in uh, general commerce. Now, if George was trying to get married and have a wife, which he never did, he'd run into things like miscegenation mis laws that would prevent him from marrying a white woman or a Mexican woman or something like that. So uh, the, the question of race is something that needs to be pulled apart a bit more. But in terms of the archaeology, I don't think that was the issue. I think um, George found the Folsom site, knew he had something interesting, I think he wanted to involve people in the site and maybe he was going to sell a paleontological collection to a museum somewhere or something like that. But he wanted a cut of the action, uh, I, I imagine, because of his strong interest in ownership and everything else that he owned, he probably felt some ownership towards that site and that find. And the curious thing about it is that George dies in January 1922. And 10 months later, the archaeologists are at the site starting to dig it. The guy's uh, from Colorado, from Trinidad. And, you know, they, it finally is clear that uh, George is dead and nobody's watching the site. Now they can go dig it because George is not around. So my impression is, is that what prevented people from um, uh, digging the site in the first place was uh, 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 George and his strong interest in ownership. And I don't know how to solve that. It's going to have to come out through the historical records not through the archaeological records, but I think that played a role. Now, if George had found, George did have points, and I think he had points in his collection. So if I'm able to dig the burned cabin site, we may discover that there's Folsom points there. But um, because the cabin burned down, we don't have the proof whether he had he had points or not. So it's a it's a moot question at this point in time until we can do some field work. I think I answered that question. Uh, later on, uh, just to get back to the race thing, um, some of the people that were in Trinidad and some of the people at the museum in Denver recently have been identified as belong belonging to the KKK. And Denver has had some conversations about that in the local newspapers and, and others about whether that you know has any implications for us today and the types of collections that were being made in the 1920s and things like that, or any of the work that the museum did back then. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question as an archaeologist. I'm simply going to look at the materials that are in Folsom if I get the chance, and we're going to see if George knew more than what he did. We do know that George collected bones and that he shellacked them. And, you know, shellac is an organic chemical that is manufactured from um, bug parts uh, originally. And, and you put it on the bone and it preserves it. So his cabin burned down. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we're digging in the soil and taking soil samples and we find pieces of tiny fragments of bone with shellac on them. And then we'll say, yeah, this is where George's collection was. And then if we find, and this is all speculation, if we find Folsom points in those same deposits, then we know George knew something more than, than what anybody suspected. But we just don't know that right now. We'll have, to, we'll have to do the excavation to find out. Brian, I have a question, kind of a follow-up. You mentioned George Agagino might have had, or maybe did have George's original grave marker. And he also had George's saddle, the one you showed there. Uh, do you know anything more about Agagino's connection with McJunkin? Uh, he, he was a professor at Eastern New Mexico University for many years. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, George came to Folsom and did a lot of research with the local community uh, after, you know, George was dead and gone. But, but George Agagino uh, really was the guy that wanted to make sure that George McJunkin got credit. And so he worked with the local community. He, he collected stories. Um, he collected tales. He wrote notes. He visited many of these sites that I visited. I'm sure he's been on all of them. And um, he has materials in, in the museum there. I have not yet had the chance to be into the archives to look and see what's there. 
Uh, the work that we did with the saddle was done by a couple of people at the museum there working with me as part of Team McJunkin, and uh, we have more to do. So uh, one of my trips is going to be down there to try to assess what records they have and, and how they're organized. Um, that's, that's another you know, year and a half worth of work right there and to get into them and start looking at them and reading them and seeing how they play into what we've done so far. So it's, it's somewhere down the road we get to do that work, but it's not yet. I think our first step right now is to sort of get this publication out, to get people thinking about it. Then there's gonna be, uh, I think people are gonna wanna join Team McJunk in either in a, in a familial way or in some sort of research way and, and, and start doing more things with George because it's such an interesting story. We may find that there's some enterprising graduate student who can do that work on Agagino's um, data for us, but uh, we're not we're not quite there yet. Did did Agagino ever publish anything specifically about McJunkin? Yes, he has a number of uh, articles about McJunkin, and I think he worked pretty closely with uh, Francis Folsom, who wrote that book, and he's right. worked with others. So he's 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 mentioned George in in his journal articles and publications. So. There's a, there's a bit of stuff out there. If you go to Google Scholar and put Agagino in there, you'll see some of the some of the pieces that he wrote. But that's not a that's not a complete collection. I mean, you have to sit down and you know um, figure out the the complete set of works that he actually published. He was very pro prolific, so he George probably shows up a number of times yet that I don't know about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Do you have any other questions from the audience? Looks like that's about it. Okay, so we're hoping to uh, have a publication ready in about a year to year and a half. These things take time. We have a team of dedicated people who are um, going to do the work and they're invested in it quite heavily. And uh, we hope that it will be the thing that will spur additional work down the road. We think that we need to get the publication out because that's the gateway that leads to future work and maybe future opportunities like a field school or other activities. The great thing about this is, the final thing I'll say is, is that the Folsom Museum in Folsom, New Mexico uh, will take you out on a tour to the Folsom site and they do it on a regular basis and they have other tours and you go there and they'll talk with you about George McJunkin all day long and they'll talk about uh, historical archaeology and all that. But the one thing that they haven't been doing to date is using any of the historical archaeological sites on the ranches mm -hmm. um, uh, and incorporating that data into, into the work that they're doing. So if we're able to go out and do some real uh, field work in the next phase, like do some mapping, testing, collection, things like that. Then we'll have a, a, a whole new set of data that the museum can use. We're hoping that uh, some of our work will lead to that because that will sustain the work, uh, the museum in the future. And it's the, it's the golden goose that's gonna help keep them going because they have actually now new, new data and new information, two streams of information about George. We have the, we'll have the stream of information about the Folsom site, to, to show the tourists and we'll have the stream of information about George's quotidian life and ranch life in Folsom that will also enthrall the tourists. There's a lot of people interested in black cowboys and so they wanna know what he was really doing out there and we think we can tell the story. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, have a lovely fall and hopefully we'll see you next month. Have a great evening. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.